I couldn't help thinking today when Greg was talking about Announcement Sunday. It just brought back that, that memory to me when I decided that I was going to retire. And at the church that I served, right after the announcements, the choir went bang right into the first hymn. But so I stood up that Sunday and I said, well, after a lot of thinking, um, I'm deciding that this is my last year here, I'm going to be retiring. And immediately the choir stood up and sang, what a friend we have in Jesus. I'll never forget that. We are on our uh, series of Everyday God, and today we're going to be talking about relationships, and we're going to be looking in the book of Acts, the first 19 verses of chapter 9. This is from the Living Bible. But Paul, threatening with every breath and eager to destroy every Christian, went to the high priest in Jerusalem. He requested a letter addressed to synagogues in Damascus requiring that cooperation in the persecution of any believers he found there, both men and women, so that he could bring them in chains to Jerusalem. As he was nearing Damascus on this mission, suddenly a brilliant light from heaven spotted down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Who is speaking, sir? Paul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and await my further instructions. The men with Paul stood speechless with surprise, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. As Paul picked himself up off the ground, he found that he was blind. He had to be led into Damascus and was there three days, blind, going without food and water all that time. Now there was in Damascus a believer named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. And the Lord said, go over to Straight Street and find the house of a man named Judas and ask there for Paul of Tarsus. He is praying to me right now, for I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias going in and laying his hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I have heard about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And we hear that he has arrest warrants with him from the chief priests authorizing him to arrest every believer in Damascus. But the Lord said, go and do what I say. For Paul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the nations and before kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for me. So Ananias went over and found Paul and laid his hands on him and said, Brother Paul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit and get your sight back. Instantly, it was as though scales fell from his eyes. Paul could see and was immediately baptized. Then he ate and was strengthened. He stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. Wow. God's reading to us. He was the only Christ I ever knew. I've never forgotten those words that were spoken by a prisoner in a federal penitentiary. He made the comment when he heard about the death of a former inmate. The prisoner had led a very hard life, a lot of cruelty, a lot of rejections, a lot of poverty, but this other prisoner had at the time an older man who had befriended him, listened to him, giving him some hope for the future. And when he had left the prison and died, and when word came back, 
This prisoner said he was the only Christ I ever knew. I assume he meant by that that in the relationship with this older man, his caring, his listening, his being present to him, he experienced for the first time what people are talking about when they speak of knowing Christ. In some real way, there was a presence, divine presence there for him. And it's very important incident for us trying to understand the ways God makes his presence known to us. And today, we want to see how God makes his presence known to us in relationships with other persons as the prisoner experienced it in the incident that I just had shared. The story today, though, is the one that we feel is one of the most important, and it's in the book of Acts. It's one of the best-known instances in the Bible, but there is a dimension of it we often ignore. I did for many years, and that's what I want for us to look at this morning. I'm talking about the conversion of Paul which is described in three separate times in the book of Acts. It's so important. Paul had been a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had threatened the Christians. He had intimidated the Christians. And he was actually persecuting the Christians. He was present at the stoning of Stephen. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, goes out of his way to let us know that Paul was there. And he witnessed this, and he approved of it, the death of the first Christian martyr. Just build up a tension inside of Paul because Stephen died with such a sense of peace and forgiveness, which Paul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, the super religious man, had not experienced yet. And this tension was increased until it broke dramatically on the road to Damascus, and Paul had a vision of the risen Christ. A dramatic, life-transforming, mystical experience, a confrontation with Christ. And then the story, though, goes on. And this is the part I think we have often ignored. Paul goes into Damascus where he is blinded temporarily. He cannot eat. He doesn't drink. And he is ministered to by a disciple, Ananias. Ananias was in a dream, called to go to Paul and help Paul. And at first, he protested. He didn't want to go. He was the enemy of the Christians. He didn't want to do that, but he finally went. And this is one of the most beautiful moments in all of church history. When Ananias lays his hands on Paul and says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road by which you came and sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a result... He was able to rise. He began to preach Christ almost immediately. Now, what I would like for us to do is to think for a moment about the two ways in which Paul experienced God's presence in this particular moment. The first thing to do is to remind ourselves of what the Scripture has been telling us all along, that God is a gracious God who takes the initiative in coming into our lives and acting in our lives in many different ways. And it is through faith, through trust, if you will, primarily, that we're able to receive, accept this grace of God. And as we respond to the grace of God, We experience the wholeness of life that is God's purpose for each and every one of us. This is what the Scripture has been telling us. Now, what we discover in this particular incident in the Bible is that sometimes God comes to us in what 
I think for a better term, we would call it a mystical experience. And by that I mean there's this awareness of his immediate presence and oftentimes a mystical experience of this kind is very dramatic. It was blinding for Paul. He experienced Christ, the risen Christ actually speaking to him. And it was such a life-transforming experience that he changed his name from Saul to Paul. I mean, it was, it was show how he was a completely different new person. And the thing about this is that while it happens to certain individuals, it's very rare. And even to those individuals who have had it, it is maybe once or twice in the lifetime, if that. Paul kept referring back all of his lifetime to this great experience because it was never repeated, certainly in the same way. So this is one of the ways that God makes himself known to us, but it's very rare. Now, some of you may have had one, but what we see in the story also is a more usual way that God comes to us, and that's in our relations with other people. As we relate to them every day in countless ways, God comes through those relationships. That's precisely what is happening as Ananias comes to him with the food and with the water and with compassion and with forgiveness to minister to Paul. Paul experienced the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, He felt himself being accepted. He felt himself being loved. He received new power, healing as a result of this. And and it is just as important as what happened to him on his mystical experience. It's an important part of the story that God came to him through the relationship with Ananias. Now, it's very important for us to understand that, it seems to me, because while the mystical experience is so rare, we are constantly having relationships with other people. And if we understand that God's grace is present in those relationships, we can be so much more aware of God's presence in our lives as a result of it. Now, as I live with the story, there are two things about Ananias and Paul and their relationship with each other that I find particularly helpful in making it possible for me to make better use of my relationship with other people in terms of my own religious life. One of them, the obvious thing is in this story, is that Ananias came with great compassion with forgiveness for Paul. And this, to me, is one of the most telling parts of the story because Paul had really been an enemy of the early church. So I can understand Ananias protesting, I don't want to go. And I, have, I don't want to have anything to do with this man. But ultimately, he went and he helped. And the forgiveness of God came with great compassion. It's one of the most, like I said, one of the most beautiful moments in the history of the church when Ananias walks in there. And here's this blind man, enemy of the church. I mean, you know what I would have done? I think I would have been tempted to say to him, see, that shows you what happens to those who oppose God. See what happened to you? And just express anger and revenge. (laughs) Ha! God got you, you know, but instead of that, this great compassion is here. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you along the way has sent me to you that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it just makes me realize that when compassion is present, forgiveness is present and caring is present. This real sensitivity, it creates an atmosphere in which God can be present in very special ways. He can use all of our relationships 
as ways to come to us. Have you ever thought of that? But especially when we are compassionate and caring. So this is one of the things. And it's one of the things I remember about Mother Teresa. Remember that dear saint? She meant so much that I've read a lot of the things that she had written about her ministry and to those whom she called the poorest of the poor. And what she tells her sisters, those who worked with her in this ministry, is that through their compassionate ministry and caring for others who are poor in this way, that they will experience Christ. They will experience the presence as a result of this companionship and compassion. So, compassion and forgiveness. But there's one other thing that is so important, and this is maybe one we got to work on, and it's honesty in relationships. This is one of the striking things to me about his feelings when he is first called to go and minister to Paul, this enemy of the church. He does not want to go. He's angry. He's feeling revenge. He is protesting and resisting, but he's able to express that. He didn't keep it inside. He didn't say to God what I think God wants me to say. I want to tell him how I really feel. He's able to say exactly how he feels. He's able to get it out. And apparently, though we don't have all of the details in the story, he's able to work through that enough so that he can go to be with Paul and he can be completely honest. He's not carrying a lot of hidden resentment in doing this, a lot of uh, buried revengefulness and desires. He's able to completely be open and honest. He's worked all of that through. And I think this is so important because we play games with each other all the time with our relationship. I'm reminded of the story of the, of the wife who managed to control her husband even after he died. Yes, the man's last name was Brown, okay, Brown. And when he was born, his parents decided that since Brown is such a common name, let's give him an unusual first name. So consequently, they named him fantastic. How would you like to go through life as being Mr. Fantastic Brown? Well, he did. And he put up with the constant joking about his unusual name all of his life. He hated his name. And on his deathbed, he said to his wife, I have only one request. Don't put fantastic on my tombstone. Please, just one word, brown. That's all I want. I don't want that name following me to my grave. Well, after he died, his wife was so upset because he had been such a good husband, and she just could not let it be as he willed. So as a result, the inscription on the tombstone read, Brown, during his long marriage, he never looked at another woman. And everybody who walked past that tomb said, that's fantastic. <laughs> well, she wouldn't leave it alone, wouldn't leave it alone. And we do that in relationships. There's so much dishonesty in our relationship between husbands and wives and parents and children and friends and neighbors and people that we work with with others. And this dishonesty seems to block the flow of the Holy Spirit, of the presence of God. Where if we could just work at being aware of our feelings and learning how to express them honestly, openly, and directly, God can use those relationships 
in beautiful ways. And I think this is what I see happening in the relationship between Ananias and Paul. The fact that he was able to be honest with his feelings created a relationship with God and God could use that to his glory. So I'm very grateful for what Dr. Luke has done for us in this particular passage because all the other times I have read it, I'm going to be honest with you, my emphasis and my attention has been upon Paul's conversion and how dramatic that mystical moment was. But I've come now to have a new appreciation for the story because Luke has made a beautiful writing and included in the way God came to Paul through the relationship that's so important. And I can remember finally, I can remember thinking the other day when, when Charles Colson, do you all remember Charles Colson of Watergate fame? That's the one I'm talking about. Charles Colson came and visited Wesley Theological Seminary when I was there in D.C., And he talked with us, and he was telling us how that when he was in prison, everything seemed to be caving in on him. His father had died while he was in prison, so he was unable to attend the funeral. His son was arrested. He was in trouble. You can tell, you know, he's mad at his dad, so he's rebelling. He's in all kind of trouble, really needed his dad, and he couldn't be there. His license to to uh, practice law was taken away from him. Everything was going wrong. And at that time, he got a telephone call from Al Queed, one of his friends, who said to him, he discovered an old statue which made it possible for one person to go and serve out the sentence of another person who was in prison. And Al Queed offered to do this for Charles. And Colson described that experience. He said, I knew Christ through this experience as never before. I'd felt his presence all right, but now I knew his power and love through the deep caring of my friend. And in the hours that followed, I discovered more strength than I'd ever known before. And now Charles Carlson in his book, and when he was uh, with us at the seminary, he talked about his conversion and how his life was transformed. And indeed, as someone in my class said it, it's one of the most dramatic conversions since the conversion of Paul back 2,000 years ago. Because of the complete turnaround in this man's life. But here is Chuck Colson telling us that the most dramatic thing of all in the conversion was the sense of God's presence to him that came to him through the relationship with his friend. And he told me after class as he was talking that God had never been more real to him than he was in that experience. God sometimes comes to us in profound, mystical experiences, yes. But as Charles Colson discovered, his presence is often most real when he comes to us through our relationship with others.